In the ancient lands of Iran, Shapur II, often called the Great, rose as the mighty 10th king of the Sasanian Empire. From his birth in 309 to his last breath in 379, he ruled for an astonishing 70 years, a record no other Iranian king has ever matched. Born to the ruler Hormiz II, Shapur's tale is one of destiny, even legend. Under his watchful eyes, ancient Iran transformed. Its armies grew stronger, its borders stretched farther, marking the beginning of a golden age. Many rulers have graced this empire like Shapur I and Khosrow I, but none would shine as brightly as Shapur II. Yet those who followed in his steps struggled to find the same glory. For by 16, this young king was already a formidable leader, sending shivers down the spines of Arabian tribes who whispered his name, Dul Akhtaf, he who pierces shoulders. Religion under Shapur was a serious affair. It was during this time that the Holy Zoroastrian scriptures, the Avesta, were brought together. Christians, however, would find it hard under his rule, likely because of the Roman Empire's turn to Christianity, yet he showed kindness to the Jews, granting them many freedoms. By the end of his era, the Sasanian Empire was a force to be reckoned with, casting its shadow far and wide. The name itself, Shapur, also echoed throughout empire. It meant son of a king. Some tales place it among Arabic Persian lists, but it seemed like an intruder there, the name traveling through time and various languages, for example, also appearing in Greek, Latin, and Arabic stories. After the passing of Hormuz II in 309, chaos reigned. His son, Adur Narse, had briefly taken the throne only to meet a tragic end. The empire's nobles, hungry for power, would turn against Hormuz II's other sons. Yet in a twist of fate, they kept the throne warm for Shapur II. Legends say they even crowned him before he was born, placing the crown on his expecting mother. While historians debate this, one thing is certain. By 16, Shapur was in command. Early in his reign, the heart of the empire, Pars, faced threats from wandering Arab tribes. They sought the riches of places like Gore and ventured into lands such as Mashan and Mazun. But under Shapur, the empire was ready to rise and meet these territorial threats. In the fiery days of his youth, as mentioned previously, at just the age of 16, Shapur II rose with a fierce determination against these Arab intruders. Ancient scrolls, like those penned by Al-Tabari, speak of Shapur choosing a battalion of a thousand elite horsemen hinting at the legendary Hushtigban unit's presence. His sights were set on the Layyad tribe in the land of Asoristan. Riding the winds of war, he crossed the shimmering Persian Gulf to the spaces between what we now know as Bahrain and Qatar, venturing to places like al Qat. His relentless march didn't stop there. The mighty Hajar Mountains echoed his challenge to the Banu Taman tribe. Shapur, in his strategic brilliance, would turn the very desert against the Arabian tribes. He filled their life-giving wells with sand, crippling the desert wanderers. But his ambitions, they reached beyond the Persian Gulf, and his banner of war flapped in the winds of the Syrian desert and the western Arabian regions as well, laying siege to cities and even reaching the gates of Medina. Among the Arabs, whispers of his ruthlessness turned to fearful shouts. As mentioned, they named him Dul Akhtaf, he who pierces shoulders, a chilling tribute to his ferocity. Under Shapur's might, Arab tribes found themselves driven deep into the heart of the Arabian Peninsula. And with strategic genius, he shifted entire tribes like chess pieces, the Taglib to lands like Bahrain, the Banu Bakr to the realms of Kirman, and others 
to strategic fortresses. The ancient Zoroastrian scrolls Bunda Heshin tell tales of Shapura's relentless campaigns. They speak of initial Arab victories overshadowed by Shapur's merciless retaliation. It paints vivid pictures of his iron will, his unforgiving dealings with Arab leaders, and his most cruel methods of punishment. But Shapur II wasn't just a conqueror, he was also a builder. He sowed the seeds of the Sasanian Empire along the Persian Gulf, setting up colonies guarded by Persian warriors, vital lands such as the Musandam Peninsula and Rustak of today's Oman were fortified under his watch. To shield the empire from future Arab onslaughts, he would birth a massive defense, the Wall of the Arabs, or Kandak Sabur, standing proud near Al-Hira. Shapur's ambitions also looked to the past. He sought to undo the Peace of Nisibis from 299, a treaty that his grandfather Narsis signed, which had granted the Romans, in his opinion, too much power. The treaty had pushed the empire's boundaries precariously close to the heart of the Sasanian capital. With Rome's new embrace of Christianity and their meddling in Sasanian affairs, tensions flared. Two epic wars would rage, birthed from these old rivalries, and Shapur's burning desire to rewrite a history he felt was wronged. As the year 337 dawned, a spark ignited by Rome's alliance with Roman Armenia would burst into flames, ending the four-decade-long peace crafted in 297 between the emperors Narsa and Diocletian. What followed were two epic wars that would span decades, from 337 to 350, and then from 358 to 363. Though much of their stories remain hidden in the mists of time, Shapur II, after silencing a rebellion from the south, cast his gaze towards Roman Mesopotamia, seizing Armenia in his grip. Great battles raged, like the famed Battle of Singara, where Constantius II tasted victory only to be surprised under the cloak of night. The Roman stronghold of Nisibis stood defiantly against Shapur's three assaults, halting his triumphant march. As Shapur grappled with Rome, threats from the Scythian Masagetai and Central Asian wanderers loomed large. Around this time, the Huns, probably the Kidarites, rose, menacing both the Sasanian and the distant Gupta empires. Yet after much clashing of swords and shields, peace was brokered, and the Hunnic king Grumbatis pledged to stand with Shapur against Rome. As the 350s dawned, Shapur II advanced his empire's boundaries deep into the territories now known as Afghanistan and Pakistan by subduing the kushano sasanian kingdom. However, this dominance was transient, with the Kidarites and Alkan Huns eventually dislodging the Sasanian grip in the following years. Further south in the region of Sindh, straddling modern-day Pakistan and India, Golden coins bearing the hallmark of Shapur II's design would make their appearance, signaling Sasanian influence if not outright control. Shapur's coinage, often imprinted with his visage, not only served as a key medium of exchange, but also emphasized his divine rule and the empire's Zoroastrian roots. We do see a vast erosion of religious tolerance under Shapur's rule. Initially, he maintained a benign stance towards his Christian subjects guided by Patriarch Shemon Bar Sabai. But political shifts, notably the aforementioned embrace of Christianity, would see distrust in Shapur's mind. This distrust, amplified by continued Roman wars, morphed into direct antagonism. As tensions escalated, Christians found themselves burdened with a punitive double tax, a levy that Patriarch Shemon staunchly opposed. The subsequent pressure on Christians to adopt Zoroastrianism only intensified resistance, marking the dawn of what would be known as the Martyr Cycle, a dark era of Christian persecution within ancient Iran. On the 14th of January in 346, the bishop Barba Skimenus, along with his 16 fellow clergymen, met a grim fate. The wave of persecution was extensively chronicled by Sozomen in the 5th century, who estimated that a staggering toll of over 16,000 named martyrs, with innumerable others unnamed. By 358, 
The fires of war would call to Shapur once more. What would be known as the Amada Standoff in 359 saw the mighty walls of Amada besieged by the forces of the Sasanian Empire. Commanded by Shapur, the city, bolstered by its Roman fortifications, stood defiant as Shapur sought to take advantage of Emperor Constantius II's absence. Sabinianus led the main Roman force. As Persian shadows grew longer, Romans instructed their people to adopt a scorched earth approach, and the fortified Amida prepared itself for the storm ahead. Shapur first considered bypassing strongholds like Nisibis, focusing on Syria. But after a Roman garrison provoked him by killing Grumpadi's son, a key ally, his wrath turned directly towards Amida. And for over 70 days, the city withstood his relentless assault. At times, it seemed the city might buckle, especially when elite Persian archers temporarily secured a tower or when disease briefly plagued the defenders. Yet the Romans held, even launching a daring night raid against the Persian camp. However, using mounds, the Sasanian forces eventually breached the walls, resulting in a brutal conquest. Shapur's victory came at a high cost. His forces decimated Amida, executing its leaders and relocating its citizens. And while the city fell, the Sasanian king did not gain the significant strategic edge that he sought. Many of his allies deserted, questioning the price of the victory. The next spring saw both empires in a standoff, with neither leader keen to engage. However, with Constantius distracted by Julian's uprising and Shapur's hesitance, 361 would see a stalemate. It wasn't until Constantius's death in October that this chapter of the Roman-Sasanian rivalry would conclude, leaving no clear victor. The next Roman emperor, Julian the Apostate, thirsted for revenge. He marched to the gates of Shapur's capital, Tessaphon, and even as he won battles, he could not penetrate the city's walls or confront Shapur's main force. Tragedy would strike when Julian fell to a fatal injury. His heir, Jovian, in a rush for peace, gave away vast lands to Shapur, leading to a peace treaty that saw Rome relinquish territories and influence in Armenia. With Roman threats now at bay, Shapur turned his might to Armenia, imprisoning its king. He attempted to spread the teachings of Zoroastrianism, but he faced the fierce spirit of the Armenian people. The economy under Shapur also flourished. Under his leadership, the Sasanian Empire experienced a robust economic era driven by multifaceted strategies and the Empire's strategic positioning. Central to this prosperity was a systematic taxation system where lands were meticulously measured and duties levied, generating significant revenue. This was supplemented by customs duties from the bustling Silk Road, where the Empire capitalized on its intermediary role between the Roman West and the Eastern Kingdoms. Agriculture formed the backbone of the economy, facilitated by an intricate network of canats that transformed arid terrains into fertile fields. The spoils of war and tributes from subdued regions further bolstered the state's treasury. Vibrant urban centers like Tessiphon emerged as pivotal economic hubs, bustling with trade and craftsmanship. The crafting of luxury goods, especially textiles and metalworks, reached its zenith under his rule, catering to both local and foreign markets. The land's wealth was concentrated among the nobility and the influential Zoroastrian clergy, fostering a system reminiscent of feudal hierarchies. Throughout his reign, Shapur II skillfully navigated the empire through both prosperous and challenging times, leveraging a blend of war, diplomacy, and economic reforms. Shapur II's reign was a pivotal time for the empire. After his passing in 379, the leadership was briefly taken up by his brother, Ardashir II, until Shapur's son, Shapur III, was ready to rule. Under Shapur II's leadership, the empire had grown in size and become more stable. His contributions and strategies created a lasting foundation, positioning the Sasanian empire for continued success under future rulers.